I remember sitting with a typewriter. It was yellow in my uh, parents' house with a cigarette in my mouth and, and trying to, to um, put together some, some um, poems. But, you know, those poems are... They, they never amounted to anything. And, um, Do you still have it? No. Um, and I wrote some short stories and they got published in the uh, college new paper and, and so on and so forth. But, um, and throughout my career as well, I mean, I've written um, on-air promotion taglines and, you know, all kinds of things like that. Um, I've edited numerous scripts for, for um, TV shows and dramas and, and God knows what for other people. Uh, I've written a few myself. Um, never told anybody I wrote them. Um, so I was a bit of a shy, shy person in that sense. But when sort of uh, I had a little bit of time, I started writing prose and, and um, as an exercise. I, I was just keeping my mind going. And, and uh, then I suddenly started seeing that these little nuggets I had been written sort of fitted together and, and um, um, out came this, this book. Tell me one thing, mm. uh, you wrote it in English. I did. English is not your uh, native tongue, nope. uh, even though you've been speaking English most of your life, like Icelanders do. Mm -hmm. uh, you may be even more than some of us because you have been living in, in foreign countries where mm -hmm. English is, is spoken frequently and even is the main language of the country. But putting together a whole book uh, that is about uh, 250 pages. Was it an easy task? It was a natural task in a way because uh, it wasn't a decision, it wasn't a conscious um, uh, decision to make. Um, I was in a situation where I was speaking English uh, on a daily basis so it would have been more of an effort to, to write in Icelandic at that moment. Um, and as I say, when I started out, it was supposed to be exercise. And um, as it turned out, it, it just started uh, having a life of its own. And, and uh, I sort of had to stop. You know, I had to find, find an end, end point. And, and um, I sent the manuscript to Olympia Publishing in London. And they were the only publishers I sent it to. I got an email back from them saying, oh, it's going to take, you know, one of these, um, not from a person, but, you know, just because you sent me, I sent you back. And they, in that blurb, they said, it's going to take six weeks, six uh, to eight weeks to, uh, to process it. An automatic reply from... Uh, yes, from, from the, that's it. From the editor. Yeah. They answered me back within two weeks. One thing about the writing, uh, in case to keep things together and mm -hmm. glue the whole story together. You need to make out a storyline and you have to remember which person is which and such and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, did you do it the scientific way or was it just, you know, did it just write it itself? Well, this is really funny. I, I, I don't know. I've, I've never done a course in, in um, writing or, or I've read oodles of books, mm -hmm. you know. I remember going into the... Um, library and, and finding out that there was nothing new for me to read, which was quite a... So I, I went into the uh, history section and, and started taking different kinds of, kinds of books. But anyway, that's a different story. So I no, no, there was no science in this. It's just um, the story grew. Uh, for me to put this together it was was quite natural in a way, and it was in real time, if you like. I didn't take this chapter and put it in front of the other or, or because it fitted better. It, it's just linearly written like it, like it appears on the pages. Do you think that a, a, a novelist, a writer, mm. uh, needs to read a lot to be able to write a lot? Um, we're all different and, and the answer to this is yes and no. I mean, it's probably beneficial to read because then you get... Um, uh, the feeling for different uh, ways of telling a story and, and you learn, you know, there's a, quite a difference between T Dickens and, and George Orwell in the way they, they tell stories. I'm mentioning two British writers, but that's my education, I guess. But um, 
So you get that feeling, but I think the main thing is to have the sense and, and the, the curiosity for your environment. Even if you write, you know, an artistic novel, and you know this, um, which this one isn't. This is this is more of a sort of, I wouldn't say pop fiction, but more in that vein more than, 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 than um, a, an artistic novel. Yeah. Um, so, but you you as a writer, you you have to have interest in people. You have to yeah. have interest to tell the people the stories. You have to have interest to tell the people stories you know, to learn from that. And, and uh, I mean, th I think that's the main thing. Where did the characters of this book, this book come from? Are, are they based on real people that you know? No, not so much. No. I mean, I stole a couple of names. You um, mm -hmm. If you hear this, Adrian Charles, <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I borrowed your name and, and um, because I think it's, it's great and I think you're great. And, and, um, it's a cool name. It's a cool name. And he was my main editor when I was at um, ITV. <laughs> and um, but the character is is far from built on him. It's nothing nothing um, like him. But um, no, it's it's probably fragments of of people. No, I I don't recognize anyone in particular there. Uh, the antagonist is English. Yes. Yes. Uh, you decided to have him of that nationality rather than Icelandic. Mm -hmm. Any particular reason for that? The story is told uh, to begin with from the perspective of um, the GM, general manager of the then BBC, decides to set up a pirate station on, you know, in a different location to the BBC because he feels that the BBC has been locked down, it's been hamstrung, it's been silenced um, for some reason. This is a futuristic novel uh, and it's a dystopic novel mm -hmm. uh, taking place in a future that could be a shorter distance away than we can imagine. Uh, and it is addressing issues like the weather. Mm -hmm. Uh, the climate change uh, and even politics of the time. Uh, is it a, is it a dark novel? Do no. people want to throw it away while reading because it's too gloomy, or is it? Does it give you a ray of hope? I hope so. Yes, but it's not a dark um, novel. I mean, uh, it's not like uh, what's that film I saw yesterday? Midnight Sun. That's the one. And. Um, but it's not, and there's a ray of hope, and, and there's sort of a saviour that comes in, in in the form of um, aliens and what have you. I'm not going to tell you too much not about too it. Much, no. But the scary thing is that when we're sitting here, we're hearing stories from, from um, Austin, Texas. Hell has frozen over. Um, they're without electricity, they're without water, they're, you know, they're freezing, they're sitting in the cars um, with the um, um, aircon of the car on full blast hot to, mm. to, to keep warm and so on and so forth. So these are sort of things happening. This week I read about the Gulf Stream which keeps the UK cozy and warm and, and Iceland as well and gives us um, the breeding ground for our fish and so on and so forth. It comes all the way from the Gulf of Mexico, that's why it's called Gulf Stream. Um, and they are saying there's anomalies in the Gulf Stream, which means that there's something going on and what's going on. And of course, uh, it's written by somebody who's, I'm not going to tell you how old I am, and you know anyway, but I'm not going to tell, uh, tell the audience. Um, but I grew up in the echo of, of the punk era and and um, with the threat of nuclear wars hanging over me. Now I'm learning that we actually had a couple of close calls in that respect. And the infatuation with, with the sheer stupidity of going down this road of manufacturing to grow the economy and the economy is supposed to grow by 14, 50% per year on annual basis. It's unsustainable. And we're buying, dare I say it, crap 
to throw away. You know, yeah. A few decades ago, you got a wristwatch as a confirmation gift, and you wore it your whole life. It might, might break down, but you took it to a watch, uh, watchmaker, and, and he fixed it for you. Things seem to be changing now. I just could not an author of the pa Banana Garden. Uh, maybe the pandemic is teaching us to see things in a new respect. Absolutely. I'm, I mean, the coronavirus is dreadful. It's it's a horrible situation to be in. But you always have to look at it on the bright sides and think, OK, at least what's done is that it's a global pandemic. It's Nobody is untouched. But what it brings home to me is is that we are all interconnected. We are all the same. We might be different colors, creeds, and, and from different um, cultural backgrounds and so on, but we are all human beings. There is a planet B in that book, but at the moment there is no planet B for us. We only got this one. Very interesting, everything that you've been telling us, Ajat Gunnarsson, the author of Banana Garden. Uh, a few more questions before we stop this little conversation of ours. Um, did your stay in Papua, in any way, influence you, yourself, mm -hmm. the writer himself, while you were writing this book? Did this isolation, warmth, and the villages, in any case, absolutely, make you write this book? Uh, well, it didn't make me write the book. It but didn't? Are you it, sure? Would you have written it in Iceland? Had you been staying in Iceland? Probably not. Probably not. No. So You're right. It You're made right. you write it. Yeah. But in a, in a way, it's, it's the answer to this question is yes. And um, um, in the job I uh, have just left now at the University of Goroka, which is in a fantastic place of place and, and it's 1600 meters over sea level. Um, there the temperatures were at 25 degrees. It normally only rains during the night and it's wonderful. The climate is just fantastic. Um, the university is, is um, really nice and I didn't do much of teaching. I was working on uh, in a research center and we did documentaries about people in villages and I traveled all over the country in um, banana boats and, uh, and um, uh, small airplanes and on, on PMVs, public motor vehicles um, and so on and so forth and I went into a beautiful village which had yeah I mean they grew all the, their food and they, they were running their own school which wasn't sanctioned by the um, local authority or the, or the government, so they financed it themselves, they hired the teachers and so on, and it was a beautiful place, absolutely gorgeous. We, we came there from uh, Matang, it was a three, three hour uh, boat ride, and no harbour, nothing, you had to jump off the boat and, and walk into the village. Fantastic adventure, and, and we stayed there for probably seven days. And there they told me, uh, yeah, I mean, we had to move the, our gardens um, further away from the sea because the sea is eating into the shore. And, and uh, um, up in the highlands, uh, they can't grow the same crop as they had uh, before. They have to find different varieties or grow different crops or, or so on and so forth because the heat is increasing. Um, they're getting um, mosquitoes, malaria. Um, they are moving up the mountains as well because the they travel with the uh, warmer climate. So they, they feel it on their own skin, if you like, literally. On, you know, the mosquitoes are on the skin and, and so on and so forth. So, uh, yes, I mean, it brought it home. Because from here, you're often, we have the storms, we have this and that, and, and, but it's, it's not as near to us. There, it was actually in your face. It was really, really near to you. Uh, so this village, this wonderful village where everything is changing, is that your banana garden? No, no, not at all. Uh, the banana garden is basically um, the house I lived in, um, in Tokarara, in uh, Port Moresby, which is uh, when I came to Moresby first, I was shown a map of the city, and Tokarara was a no-go area. But 
over the year or so, they they um, changed their mind, the security guards and whatever, and it became, became um, a fine area. And I lived there for near enough a year in a family home, and that's where the banana garden is, at the edge of the um, garden where banana trees. And when I'm describing where the protagonist from, from um, Papua New Guinea hides from the storms, he's actually hiding in that little ravine or whatever you can call it, um, where the banana tree stood. And that's, that's the banana garden. Enough said about the novel. We must leave something for the reader, don't mm. we? I just could not on. Uh, the author of The Banana Garden, a brand new novel uh, out in uh, October of mm -hmm. 2020. That's right. Uh, one thing that I wanted to ask you before is did it get edited? Was somebody reading it and editing it for you? Oh, I mean, the publishers were absolutely fantastic. I mean, um, I had three or four proofs uh, sent to me and that process was really enjoyable because I always thought my um, uh, grammar and, and spelling was, was a bit questionable but it was mainly that um, because it's not my native tongue so I was mixing um, UK English or English English and the universal American English and it sort of when that models together the it, movie English that everybody knows yeah it sort of became a bit of a, a UK US English mix and they sort of um, isolated that problem and, and fixed it and they so, did not want to edit your storyline or have anything no, to do with it no not this at all the, this is the final product mm -hmm. it has been edited and it has been uh, and it's available. Well, it has been it has been proofread. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> not edited. No, that's interesting because oh. even the most famous writers get edited at mm. times. This is your first novel. Mm. Uh, what are the dreams of the first time author at this time? This was actually my life stream, you know, which mm. I've I've sort of. Um, I don't know how it's selling, or I won't know that until. It came out in, in October, and I don't know anything really until June, July. Um, so I'm Do you know how many copies were printed? No. I haven't asked, and I, I don't want to know. I, they know what they're doing, and uh, I'm doing my bit to... to um, so I'll, I'll just wait with a bated breath till June and, and see what happens. Another one is in... in um, it's sitting on that laptop in front of you and that's called Two Worlds it takes off where where this one left off it's a sequel it's a sequel the Banana Garden part two yeah and the same persons the same protagonist and uh, yeah mainly have, mainly yeah. but they they sort of I introduce others and and um, they sort of uh, yeah mix and match in the interesting things like uh, um, the uh, royalists in in um, Norway, Denmark, and, and um, yeah, those countries. Um, they tried to kill the Finnish Prime Minister because um, she is instrumental in, in um, creating a, um, a united um, Scandinavia. Oh, those Finns. Where, um, where um, um, the, the monarchy doesn't have any, any place anymore. And, um, you know, there are all kinds of shenanigans going on. I just, you are in Reykjavik now, mm -hmm. have been for several months. Uh, it takes about 32 hours yeah, it's nothing. to travel from Reykjavik to Port Moresby in mm -hmm. Papua New Guinea. Are you on your way back there? This is a very tricky question. As I, I never make plans uh, like that, but it relates to the dream of, of um, you know, if this happens and I can live off being a novelist, then you know, anything can happen, but um, the immediate answer is no, um, not at this moment, but I'm leaving behind fantastic people, and it's, it's fantastic to think about it, that I looked at the map the other day, and I thought the furthest away from Iceland you could go is Papua New Guinea, and the furthest away from Papua New Guinea you can go is Iceland.
you can't get any further away from each other, you know. And it's it's quite in, incredible that we can actually um, communicate on that level. And it comes back to the statement I made before: we're all hum, human beings, and we should start uh, acting like um, the nation of Earth instead of individual nations who are arguing about this resource and that resource and, and people getting far too rich, you know, nobody is worth um, what Elon Musk or, or um, Bill Gates, you know, nobody is worth that sort of money. I mean, I'm happy for them that they have it and, and I'm happy for their ideas and I hope um, Elon Musk gets to, to Mars, but you know, it's it's a bit of a broken system we brought all over. It's not only in Papua New Guinea. It's it's the whole. It's the world over, and it's to do with democracy. Democracy is not a f uh, infallible system, but it's the best one we've got. Um, why are more people now not living in democracies than 2019? Why is that number go decreasing? Because we're always you know, you just look at the world clock of, of birth and, and deaths and, and our population is growing uh, exponentially. Um, and um, still fewer, fewer and fewer are, are living in democracies. And I think that's the, whole, the crux of it, is that we start treating each other like human beings from whoever you are, wherever you're from, and that we have to have common values and common rules. And they, they should not be the European rule book, necessarily. Eggert Gunnarsson, the author of The Banana Garden and soon other novels. Thank you for talking to me and uh, I wish you all the best with the book. The Banana Garden was published by Olympia Publishing in, in London. It's available on their website uh, and people can also buy it on Amazon.com. Yes. Talk about rich people. Eggert Gunnarsson, Thank you very much and all the best. Thank you so much.